coronavirus pandemic has put countries on lockdown and the mission of the American Heart Association has never been more important. Based on current information, it appears elderly people with coronary heart disease or hypertension are more likely to be infected and to develop more severe symptoms. Stroke survivors may face increased risk for complications if they get COVID-19. Hi, I'm Nancy Brown, CEO of the American Heart Association, joined today by Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, Chief Medical Officer for Prevention on our team. Welcome and thank you for being here. I know that as we think about the COVID-19 pandemic, people with heart disease and stroke have a special reason to be concerned. Can you give us your perspective on that? I think people with heart disease and stroke are probably thinking about two things. Um, am I at higher risk for COVID-19? Uh, and I think the safe thing to say is that um, persons with heart disease, you are seemingly at higher risk of contracting the disease. You are also at higher risk of complications if you get COVID-19. If you're over age 60 or have underlying health conditions, you should exercise even more precautions and just stay home as much as possible. So are the symptoms that these patients with coronary heart disease or people who have had a stroke, do they exhibit different symptoms? Common symptoms are cough, fever, shortness of breath, but in some, chest pressure is a preliminary, a first symptom. And what's not clear is if that happens more in persons with um, underlying cardiovascular disease. Wouldn't surprise us if that was the case, but I can't say definitively that it's the case. Does COVID-19 do further damage to the heart or brain for people who have heart disease or who have had a stroke? from some preliminary data, uh, some of it out of China and some of it perhaps out of Italy, indeed COVID-19 causes damage to the heart muscle. And when it does that, it causes something called myocarditis. Um, and myocarditis is um, basically an inflammation or infection of the heart muscle itself. Also, it appears that in persons who have died, the cause of death was a fatal arrhythmia. And it's not entirely clear why that's happening, but that is a observation that's been made uh, that AHA would like to better understand. Yeah, that's certainly deserving of uh, further study, and we'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes. So a question that we get a lot, does the flu shot protect you from COVID-19? The flu shot will provide no protection from COVID-19. And I think it's really important that people understand that. So I'm willing to say, if you haven't gotten a flu vaccine, go get one, but be six feet away from anybody uh, uh, who's around you when you go do that. But flu vaccine does not protect individuals from COVID-19. Yeah, and it's easy to understand why people are confused. And certainly one of the reasons we're having this conversation today is to provide clarity to people that may have heart disease or have had a stroke. And one of the things that I've seen is a question of, should I, if I'm a heart patient, keep taking my medication or will my medication make me more at risk if I'm exposed to COVID-19? And we hope today to really clarify the answer to that. Yeah, if you are a person with heart disease or um, have had a stroke and you are on medications, please continue taking your medications. Uh, you are at risk of other bad things if you don't take your medications. Let's transition to people who may test positive for COVID-19. So we know that there's been a lot of discussion about the need for increased testing capacity. And as more people are tested, there's a likelihood that more people will test positive. And if that's the case, what are the treatments? What is a person to do? And certainly there are mild cases and there are severe cases. So maybe you could touch on both of those. Where you got tested isn't a place where there's a clear understanding that you have some underlying risk factors. That needs to be communicated at the test site and or with your cardiologist, your neurologist, or your primary care doc. That's critically important because of the things we talked about. What treatments are available? Truly right now, uh, the category of treatment uh, is 
what we call supportive treatment. You will be treated for the medical conditions you have, and you will be receiving things like IV fluids and other things that will help pathway um, through um, having uh, COVID-19. And shelter in place, and maybe talk about the importance of reducing and eliminating exposure. Here you and I are sure. sitting today more than six feet sure. apart. Let's talk about that. The idea of sheltering in, sp in place is that if you are, um, on the low risk side of a continuum, and again, you and your doctor will get that figured out. The idea is that you will stay where you are, take Tylenol for the fever, and the, maybe take some cough medications. Your entire family needs to stay in place. Find a buddy before you get sick that's gonna be somebody who could bring you the things that you need if indeed you have to stay in place for 14 days. And of course, the instruction will be if for any reason things advance beyond just cough and fever to shortness of breath or any other serious concerns, you need to be in contact with your provider you have vast experience in prevention. And a real commonly asked question among our heart disease and stroke patients and survivors is, where are we at with developing a vaccine? In an ideal world, we would have a vaccine that helps us uh, prevent uh, COVID-19 from ever happening, not unlike an influenza vaccine, and uh, it would be administered and it would protect you. We'd also, by the time we're there, uh, in an ideal world, we'd have treatments because sometimes people don't get vaccinated or can't get vaccinated. And in those instances, we would want a treatment. Right now, the only prevention is the prevention that we can each exercise as individuals. One is control the controllables, um, and the other one is to act as if you have the virus right now. Do all the things that you would do to keep someone else from getting that virus, washing your hands uh, a lot, making sure that uh, you touch surfaces as little as possible, that you touch your face as little as possible. But before I touched anything else, I washed my hands thoroughly. 20 seconds or more, ABC or happy birthday are both about 20 seconds long. And also be sure that you are washing down surfaces. Uh, we talked earlier, if you happen to be somebody who's in that high risk category and packages come to your home, some things that you can do in addition to what I just said is, um, A, that should be left outside your door. You put that on a counter somewhere, you take things out, you wash those things off, put them away. Now you can touch them later. Um, dispose of the container and other packaging and then thoroughly wash your hands, clean the surface, wash your hands again. Great advice, Eduardo. Another question is how can organizations, businesses, community organizations help people at high risk? Well, one is by making sure that all the things I've just said are communicated to employees. Um, two, it's to make sure that everything is done by that organization to keep people from having to do anything but the essential movement that they have to do. And the situation in the United States goes from where it is to where it'll be when we can more freely move around. And you know, the last thing I'll just say is the American Heart Association is always there making a difference. And we are here for our patients. We're here for the broad public. And we're also here to find answers scientifically. We don't know enough about that. And that's why the American Heart Association will soon be announcing very rapid action research grants for shovel ready research that can help us find answers to these. So we'd ask everyone to stay tuned um, and maybe we can have another discussion about those research awards in the coming days. Of course, uh, would make good sense that the American Heart Association would be trying to figure out what is the effect of COVID-19 on the vascular system, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and maybe even the peripheral vascular system. And with that said, Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, thank you for your incredible insight, your wisdom, and your steady leadership during this time. We are all so grateful to have had this chance to chat with you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. For more information about the connection between COVID-19 and heart disease and stroke, please visit us at heart.org.